If you have 200 plus maintainers in a squadron, like getting their buy-in to understand why their job is important. In the example of the Raptor, like, dude, you're out here turning wrenches on this airplane because we only built a very small number of these airplanes. Oh, by the way, there's no other airplane that can do what this airplane can do. And we absolutely need it. Like if we ever were to go to a near peer threat or a peer threat, like we need this airplane. Hey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you're over on YouTube, my guest today is Cabo. He wrapped up his active duty time as the F-22 demo team commander and pilot. So you might've seen him flying around the air show circuit or a video of him or two out there on Instagram or YouTube, et cetera. But enjoy talking to Cabo today. He is quite a synergistic, if that is the term, uh, path into aviation where he has some parallels and crossing. This is a pretty cool story. Enjoyed chatting with him today. Again, if you enjoy this content, if you get value out of it, you can help the show grow by following over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, leaving a rating or review, and sharing the show with a friend who might not be aware it's out there. So again, if you get value out of it, doing something as simple as taking that six to nine seconds or so and sharing that, liking, leaving a rating, that helps me out. And I'm grateful for everyone who's done that. And if you like this content too, don't forget there, there I was stories. Cabo hung around. Most guests hang around for a, there I was story. And that can be found over on Patreon or an, as an Apple podcast subscriber, you get those bonus episodes and it helps the podcast out and hopefully you enjoy it. seems like that's, that's a crowd favorite. Don't forget to check out the Afro podcast lowdown newsletter. I have that link down below all your insights in defense, aviation, geopolitics, and some fun tidbits in history as well. That being said, that's all the admin I have for today. So let's jump into the episode with Cabo. Cabo, man, thanks for joining me on the podcast. I'm glad we we're finally able to get you on here. We were trying for a bro chat today. We got a bro chat coming up later on, but we can talk behind their back, but Vader and Ben are both bailed. Uh, so Yeah, it's all good, man. A pleasure to be here. It's obviously, uh, we've known each other for a while now, and uh, I'm just really thankful I get to hang out and uh, talk about airplanes, something we both love and going fast and go upside down and all those good things. Dude, yeah. And talk about airplanes. I think we should kick it off with what's going on today. I saw you zip around. Did you buy an RV? I did. Uh, so I, I bought an RV, uh, eight, and really it was a function of, you know, I, I moved to Reno, okay. uh, my new life post active duty, which has been good. Uh, but I still work uh, for the International Guard down in Vegas at Nellis Air Force Base. And then I also volunteered at a museum in Southern California at Plains of Fame. And I was like, dude, this drive is getting brutal. You know, it's like <clears throat> seven and a half, eight hours. And I was doing that multiple times a month. And uh, I just couldn't take it anymore. And then Screech, so I'll kind of give the background on him a little bit. But I bought his RV-8. And um, because he was like, yeah, I'm going to sell my RV-8. And dude, it's like the perfect commuter. It goes fast. It's not expensive to operate. You can still go upside down. You can put all the stuff you want in the back. Um, so I was like, oh, it seems like a perfect fit. And um, yeah, it worked out. So I bought it in uh, early December and finally flew it back to Reno um, last week. So uh, went to Texas to pick it up and then kind of picked through some storms and uh, sat out. I actually hung out with Gator from uh, nice. A10 demo. Nice, nice. Uh, saw him, saw Mad, and we got to hang out with him in Tucson overnighted there. And uh, then made my way back to Reno. Dude, that's awesome. So we'll, we'll talk. About yeah, it's it, no, it's it's cool because it's the connection there is just is is awesome with Screech. Um, yeah. You know, I, I grew up. My family's originally uh, majority of my family's originally from Cuba. We came over back in the '60s, and um, you know, nobody in my family flies airplanes. Um, and I just knew from a very young age. I was like, hey, I, I want to fly jets. You know, I don't know why. Um, Shout out to the Navy bros. Maybe it was a, uh, maybe it was Top Gun. Who knows? You gotta give Top Gun um, some credit. Yeah. I have to give Top Gun some credit, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I, I would go to air shows all the time. My mom in Tampa, Florida, and I was 11 years old. We go to uh, McDill air force base and check out the air show. And uh, you know, my favorite jet growing up uh, was the Eagle. I just yeah. loved the airplane. Yeah. I know. Hey, Hey, by the <laughs> way, happy belated, happy belated 50th birthday to the Viper. Yeah, man. Thank um, you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so 
Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I love the Eagles, like two big yeah. engines, two big tails, like just America, strap on a yeah. bunch of missiles. It's just awesome. So I see this thing flying yeah. around and I'm like, yeah, this guy. that's what I want to do. That, just like that guy. Yeah, yeah. the debrief book, man. Um, it's a lot, there are a lot of Eagle kills in the uh, complete debrief or history debrief of aerial engagements from 1981 to, to present. So, yeah, a lot of Eagle it's, kills. A, it's a great book. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I see this Eagle jet flying around and I'm just like mesmerized as an 11 year old kid. And my uncle played, you know, professional baseball. I look very similar to him. My family was like, oh, play baseball, play baseball. So I love the sport of baseball. But to me, seeing those jets fly overhead in an air show was just like, oh, this is incredible. And the demo pilot at the time was, uh, at, the, at the time, Captain John Screech York. And uh, he was super kind and came up to me, uh, took a picture with me. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, this is like the dude, you know. Yeah. And then I go to the Air Force Academy finish that, go to pilot training, and then go to F-15 school up in Klamath Falls, Oregon. And I round the corner and I see this guy and I'm like, dude, I, I have no idea where this, like where I know this guy from. Like he looks super familiar. Uh, and then I saw his helmet bag. It had a uh, F-15 West Coast demo team patch on it. And I was like, there's, there's like no way. <laughs> like, the chances of that happening are like zero. Um, so anyways, I don't, I didn't even approach him. I was like scared little Lieutenant. He's Lieutenant Colonel at the time. And I was like, in the B course, I'm like, I'm not going to go do that. That's stupid. Uh, so I called my mom up and I was like, hey, can you send me that picture that we took at the air show back in you know, 98? So she finds it, sends it to me, and I look at the name tag and it's it's Screech. And I'm like, holy cow, what a small world. You know, so I, I uh, eventually take that picture up to him and, and talk to him. And we find out that, like, we're from the same hometown, um, you know, uh, rival high schools, uh, Air Force Academy, glider instructors of the academy. Eagles, then he went and flew Raptors as well. So it's just crazy the parallels, right? So for me, you know, buying the RV, it's an incredible little time travel machine and uh, very, very happy with it. But to me, the more important thing is like the connection that uh, that airplane means to me. And I mean, whether I buy, I'm sure I'll buy other airplanes in my lifetime, but uh, I don't foresee getting rid of that one. It's pretty special. That's incredible. That is the full circle story that they make movies about. Yeah. That's, you don't get that anywhere uh, it's else. Super cool. And Screech, I, he better be yeah, listening very to this. Fortunate. I, I put Screech. Uh, he's literally on the, like the top of my list of guests that I've been, you know, trying to get on. And while I have I have failed him, I wanted to do it in person at Sun and Fun last year, and now here we are yeah. getting ready to come up on another Sun and Fun. So Screech, uh, he, he's on the list. I told him hey, we'll do it remote, but Screech would be a fun one to do it in person. So he needs to come on the podcast. Yeah, he he just he's just a great person. You know, I'm very thankful that. Uh, that that, you know, one event at an air show for me when I was 11 years old manifested into this, like, friendship, mentorship that I've had, you know, since I was a B-Corps student in Eagle. And um, it's been really rewarding. And I think, you know, you and I both share that in common where we got to sit in the seat as a demo pilot for our respective jets and got to travel around yeah. and talk to kids. And, you know, kind of like what Screech said, you know, he probably took thousands upon thousands of pictures, right? But, like what are the chances that one little kid's going to keep that picture yeah. and then also go to the Academy and also fly Eagles and then also be one of your students as a B course student. Uh, it's crazy, you know, but I think we're, you know, you and I are very fortunate. We had the opportunity to go do that. Um, one, obviously it's super fun um, ripping through cities, doing 600 bills, yep. low altitude. And you're like, dude, like where the cops are going to take me to jail, <laughs> right. and now, you know? Um, but uh, you know, the second and I think more important piece is like just the the impact you have um, in that position, whether you're a pilot, whether you're a maintainer, whether you're public affairs, like you get to talk to the American public and then people around the globe at large and you get to share our story, where we came from, what we do in the military, why it's important. And you get to spark, you know, some semblance of uh, joy, inspiration, whatever it happens to be. And, and quite frankly, like obviously you and I love flying jets, we love flying airplanes. Uh, but not everybody wants to do that. And that's totally cool. Like we need people from all different, you know, backgrounds and all different uh, careers. So I just looked at it as an opportunity to say, this is what I want to do. This is my passion. Here are the things I did to, to pursue it. And it worked out through a lot of hard work and, and just kind of persistency um, with it. But uh, if some little kid wants to be a teacher, doctor, lawyer, mechanic, whatever they want to do, like, Hopefully we can use the jet as a, as a tool, as a method to inspire them to achieve their goals and, and really not let somebody or something stop them from achieving it. Cause you know, you and I both have had plenty of experiences um, where hurdles come up or, 
you go through rough times and you're like, well, at the end of the day, I still want to fly jets. So I'm going to keep right. pushing for it. And a lot of kids, you know, I think need that message today. But they just need the, that level of resilience where they're like, I'm not going to let some hurdle stop me from achieving whatever goal I have. Yeah. Probably too, you can relate to this, uh, you know, same parallels, right? Had a very uh, fortunate experience young, right. That put us on this path, but having that passion and finding that passion early and then having the dedication and persistence to go out and pursue those goals, whether we, you know, if it's flying, if it's becoming an engineer, doctor, lawyer, because I had this realization, it was, I was sitting in the back of an Uber, the driver, you know, we're talking and he asked what I did. So I kind of told him, and then he wanted to know more of like when I wanted, when did I find, when did I want to do that? How did I do it? And I told him it was in you know high school really is when the bug like re- a bit and I was on this path. And he was like, how mm-hmm. fortunate are you to have found out so young what you wanted to do and to be able to go there. It's like, that's hundred percent spot on because the runway is actually like, yeah. you can always reinvent yourself. You can always do other things. So like, I don't want to downplay that, but the runway is relatively short for a lot of very specific professions that if you want to go down that path, like you got to start middle school, high school, probably college at the latest to kind of go down some of these very technical or advanced type professions, if that's a fair way of phrasing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, obviously age is a factor, you know, we, we were pulling nine plus G's and your neck and your back gets smoked. You're like, man, I was, you know, I had a young back and a young neck and I could do that all day long. Um, And uh, yeah, as you get older, it's like, like it's, it definitely takes a toll. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a great point that we are very fortunate. We wanted to, we knew we wanted to do at a young age. Um, And like you said, there, there are plenty of, plenty of amazing things out there that um, may become later on in life. I mean, Morgan Freeman, who, you know, is a phenomenal actor, didn't start until he was like 40 or something like that. You know, it's just crazy when you see stories like that. Uh, But there are some careers that you're like, yeah, you need to start younger than later. And um, I'm just very fortunate that we had that, I guess, foresight uh, early on. Yeah, no joke. Well, this is a good segue to kind of jump back to the beginning. But before we do that, I mean, I want to go a little bit further back because you mentioned the family coming from Cuba. Obviously, you uh, weren't born yet. But do you have any experiences your parents or grandparents, anyone who, like, do they share any perspectives on what it was like and why they came and maybe some of the differences between, you know, Cuba and the United States? They're, they're pretty much the same. I'm just, uh, no, <laughs> identical, <laughs> but, uh, identical. So it's uh, pretty cool. I, my grandfather on my dad's side, uh, is actually of Norwegian descent. He, uh, came to Ellis Island and then worked, uh, he was in the, uh, Army Air Corps in World War II. That's where I got the last name Gunderson. So it's a Norwegian last name, which is obviously not very Cuban. But, ish. Uh, ish. you know, yeah, exactly. Um, but the rest of my family either was, you know, born in Cuba, came over in the 60s, or, uh, had, you know, like first-generation American, but families from Cuba, and all kind of settled in the Tampa area. But, yeah, I guess that, you know, to me, that's a really important story. And I, I really think that history, whether it's talking about airplanes and history or just history uh, of societies and learning about them is really important. And uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up. Um, my parents got divorced when I was young. My mom moved back to my grandparents and they only spoke Spanish. So very broken English. But I spoke you know, Spanish growing up and was able to hear those, you know, hear those stories uh, firsthand and hear it in Spanish. There's no translation error, you know, it's just from them, which is amazing. And some of the stories are just harrowing, you know, um, you know, they pretty much made the decision once, uh, Bautista was, you know, overthrown in 59 by Castro, the Castro regime. They're like, Hey, we're not sticking around for this communism stuff. You know, we're getting out of here. And that's a tough thing. You know, like my grandparents had elementary school educations, um, and, um, you know, my grandmother's a seamstress, my grandfather's a mechanic. And to have three kids and say, hey, I'm going to leave my country. Um, I don't speak the language. I don't have a, you know, high education, but it's, it's worth it. You know, I'm, I'm willing to pursue this goal. Um, they waited for over six years to come to the States legally. So they eventually got on this list, had to wait for about six years, uh, flew over uh, December 28th of 1966. And, um, then basically started working really hard and instilled those values of like courage um, and pursuing your goals in to my mom, my, my uncles and um, similar on my dad's side of the family as well. And that to me was, is probably one of those invaluable lessons that I've ever learned and just through their experiences, but hearing, you know, 
hearing the stories of Cuba and, and um, the misery that people lived through and continue to live through where you have to get, you know, food stamps to go get food rations for your family. And hey, you have a new, you know, you have a new baby boy. Sorry, we're not really going to give you an extra food. You know, you got to figure it out yourself or um, informants like government informants on every street corner. You know, like they live on the block. And if you were to speak out against the government, they would just disappear you like you just go away. Yeah. And uh, it's terrifying, you know, and that, that's the reality for uh, countries around the globe. And it, and it was in a, a large sense for a lot of people um, throughout the last, you know, last century. And it continues to be a thing in listening to my family and hearing their stories. Um, it's just, to me, it's like a, I guess it's a symbol of like, Hey, like buyer beware, like make sure you know what you're doing in your country. Make sure you know what uh, people stand for. Make sure you know who you're voting for. Make sure you know uh, what they stand for, what their plans are, because those things impact your future. And, you know, we look at South America as an example, a lot of phenomenal orators in South America, people that can, can rouse an audience and be like, very passionate. everybody's cheering their name and it's awesome. Very passionate. Uh, but some people are just clowns, you know? And, um, and then these, these countries, uh, have, you know, lived through misery. Um, you look at Colombia as a great example of success where they're like, okay, we're going to, we're going to embrace this whole capitalism thing. It's pretty sweet. And, yeah. uh, Colombia has turned the corner big time works out. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's one of those things that I'm very fortunate. I had that experience growing up, uh, was fortunate. I learned Spanish, um, you know, as a little kid and was able to, to communicate with my grandparents and listen to the stories, um, from them firsthand. hundred percent. That's what people who gripe about this country, uh, I think just, it's not perfect, right? There's always ways to improve. But we got it pretty good. You're not worried about someone kicking your door down in the middle of the night and dragging you out because of something you yep. said, or that someone said you said that you didn't really do because they had a, a gripe or a grudge against you. And then the state rips you out of uh, your bed. I actually flew with a guy, it's probably about a year ago and his family had immigrated from Cuba. His dad was a political prisoner and he disappeared one night and never saw him again. And then they fled, fled Cuba and that happens all over the world. So yeah. Um, yeah. Be careful what you wish. I, I think you're spot on. I mean, Obviously, you can look at a recent history in America, and there are things we can work on. There's nowhere in the world that's perfect. Uh, but you and I have traveled enough to, I think, know um, that there's nowhere else I'd rather live. Yeah. And, and, oh, by the way, what are the consequences? Like, when we talk about high-stakes consequences. They're like, well, if we lose America, we lose the freedoms that we have, the democracy we have, the republic. Like, if we lose all those things, like, where do you move, right? Because I've, I've thought about that question. <laughs> and my grandfather and my grandmother had to say like, they were like, Hey, we're, you know, we're going to pick up our three young kids and move to this other country and start all over again, you know, start all over again for work, for education, for all these things. Um, and then I look at that example, I'm like, wow, it's a lot of courage, you know? And I, I really reflect on that. I was 33 years old. Um, when I really thought about that because my grandfather was 33 when he came over and, um, and I was like, would I be in a position right now as a 33 year old dude to say like, I'm going to leave America and go somewhere else if it was that bad. Um, and you know, it's, it's crazy to think about the careers it took for them. And, and like you said, countless other people that have immigrated from their home countries and moved to somewhere else for a better way of life for their family. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's like America by far is the best place to live. When you look at the holistic picture and there's nowhere else. You're like, where do you go to this America, America, at least, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're jaded or we're not jaded. We're like very partial. Yeah. Um, cause we've been very fortunate in the opportunities and the work that we've put in, in life this far, but like, where do you go? I agree. There are a lot of great places in the world. Right. But again, I think you, yeah, on for the sure. head, as far as the, the freedoms that everyone has and what is easily taken for granted when, it's just kind of, yeah. it's there and you haven't had to worry about certain problems. Again, it could always be better, but, um, we got it pretty good in my opinion. So, all right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing too, is like, you would take, um, you know, we take people from everywhere around the globe into America and like, you just become Americans. Like we're like, yeah, like, you know, wherever you're from, doesn't matter. You become Americans. I don't think you find that in other countries, uh, where, you know, if, if you move somewhere else, like you're kind of like, you're going to be, uh, a foreigner until you, until you pass away, you know, kind of thing. Whereas yeah. we were like super welcoming in America, which is awesome. 
So yeah. I know we got other things to talk about, so we can, well, no, it, we can yeah, jump off the soapbox. Well, it's, I mean, yeah, it's. I mean, I'm passionate about it. Um, I think you're passionate about it. I know you're out at Shot Show, and uh, I mentioned on my last podcast. I don't think it's come out yet, but Christian Craighead, right? So he's a br- former British SAS mm-hmm. operator. People Google him. He was just on the Sean Ryan show. I haven't gone through that entire podcast yet, but he was on the Sons of Liberty podcast. I did watch that, uh, but he he saved a lot of people's lives. He former British SAS operator who now, I think he'll be out at SHOT Show this week, so you got to go find him um, and say, hey, I would yeah. love to have him on the podcast. But it, it was interesting hearing him talk about him be, trying to become a U.S. citizen and why he wants to move here why he wants to live mm-hmm. here and why he wants to have a U.S. citizenship. And, and it's all the things we were just talking about. Like America welcomes people. Uh, you can, you have the freedoms to do things. And if you go listen to his podcast, talking about his experiences after what he has done and all the lives he's saved, it's quite, quite interesting. So um, I think, I think he said allegedly, if he was allegedly there. Yeah. Allegedly uh, on the show. Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, like <laughs> there was someone who looked like him that saved a bunch of, bunch of lives. Um, yeah. And I didn't say yeah. where, I didn't if say he where was. There, yeah, yeah. If, if you just happened to be there, it's like, yeah. um, but on the like the sons of Liberty, I guess I'm, I'm, I think I'm butchering that the first podcast that I did watch through with, and it was him talking about mm. specifically wanting to immigrate. I don't know if he talked about that on the Sean Ryan show or not, but like, I, yeah, I need to, I need to watch that cause I haven't, I haven't seen it myself. Yeah. So, yeah, we digress, but well, um, I think it's important to talk about. I mean, it's it's obviously an yeah. integral part of uh, what we do, where we came from, what we stand for, and then your background and upbringing. So, and then the, the, what molded yeah. you. So you saw Screech at a young eleven years of age, yeah. and then what was kind of some of the next? Like, was that hey, the hook, line, and sinker? Like, you're done. This is what I'm going to go do. When did it like trip? I'm going to go to the Air Force Academy. Like, start solving mm-hmm. that Rubik's cube. Yeah, you know, I I don't remember a time where I didn't want to fly jets. Okay. Like, meeting Screech and going to the air show was kind of one of those things where it was just, it just for sure like sealed the deal. Like I want to go fly Eagle jets. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, my mom would tell me that I would write to I wrote to like the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy. And I was like, I, you know, anywhere that flies jets, like I, you know, I always want to fly Eagles. But uh, if if it's Naval Academy, it's Naval Academy. And I'll go fly Hornets or whatever. Um, but uh, she said that I started writing them when I was like in elementary school and I would like have these like handwritten letters, and, like crayon, you know, and I would try to send it to the academy for like, you know, Hey, can I get some information on how they get accepted here? Because awesome. uh, I really want to go to school here. Um, yeah. So I, I don't remember a time where I didn't want to fly jets. Um, I have, you know, my uncle has this picture where he took me to like the Pensacola uh, Naval Air Museum and I'm like sitting in the cockpit of an F4 and I was probably three years old, you know? Um, I mean, granted, I, I'm, I'm sure most, you know, most parents and families like take their kids, put yeah. them in the cockpit, you know, and I, I don't think he realized that, um, that that was like legit what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just don't, I don't remember a time where I didn't want to fly jets. Um, so I started writing to the academies in elementary school, middle school, and then through high school, just every year, you know, before the, uh, the World Wide web was available, we could yeah. just do a quick Google. Um, it's like, Hey, can you send me application packages or admission stuff? Like, what do I need to do? Um, how did you find out and about it? For did me, you, it was, how did you like even know the academy existed? That's a great question. I have no idea. Maybe it was like maybe like a commercial on TV, or maybe it was yeah. like the, the you know. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. Because um, I grew up around like my, the community I grew up in was all is all ex Air Force or Navy guys, right? So like so yeah. most of them went there. So even in the time and day with no internet at your fingertips or internet period at least had like neighbors who could tell me about it. But that's, it's interesting that at such a young age, yeah. you like obviously found out about it, man, you were all in. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, it was maybe it was a guidance customer. I, so I, I don't know, but, uh, after, you know, I'm, I do remember talking to people and they were like, Hey, if you want to fly airplanes, one, your highest percentage chance of the air force Academy for sure in terms of numbers. Right. And then after that would be ROTC, then ROTS, but your highest percentage chance of getting a pilot training slot would be to the Academy and, um, that kind of sealed the deal. Um, you know, I, I just tried to do as well as I could in school to, you know, played sports, uh, was in, uh, to play music, like did those kinds of things, did the national Honor society. Um, just kind of, I guess, you know, if you take most, most Academy applicants, probably very similar, you know, path that they're taking right now. Um, 
And that's kind of what I did, but it was, it was funny. I went to summer seminar at the Naval Academy uh, and the Air Force Academy, which is like a, you know, a week long program prior to, um, prior to going to school there. And it's kind of like, Hey, check it out. Check out the campus, be here for a week. Uh, the Naval Academy is beautiful. You know, it's a beautiful campus, lots of history. We're out sailing on a boat, you know, whatever. And, um, which is cool. But I went to the Air Force Academy and I had never seen mountains in my life. I got off the plane in Colorado Springs and I was like, this is epic. <laughs> I don't know. Like, like I'm going to school here, you know, yeah. and then you see the campus. It's beautiful. It's like 18,000 acres. Um, just beautiful campus right at the base of the Rocky mountains. And, um, then the flying and the skydiving and all that stuff. And I was like, this is, this is more up my alley than, than being on a boat. Um, you know, personal preference, but uh, I just fell in love with the campus and love, uh, love the place. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, it worked out and, um, I'm just very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. No joke. And talk about a glove save, you know, I mean, boats are great and all, but I don't know, nine months on a boat and having to land on a boat also just does not, again, I've said it multiple times and I'll stand by my comment. Yeah. I have no desire to do that. Maybe once. No, two same. Like I have no, yeah. like no desire. It's, you know. And then immediately launch I mean, right uh, back off. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a great time waking up, having delicious breakfast and coffee, then flying to wing back, you know, like nice comfortable bed. Like it's like, great. You know, uh, so uh, life's all about choices. It is yeah, about choices. <laughs> <laughs> you got a question uh, that you guys every once in a while. You're like, you guys made some weird choices. I don't know. You, you chose to do this. You actually worked <laughs> really hard to be yeah. able to do this. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> ah, thankful for someone to do it. Not me. Um, obviously you do well at the Academy. We can dig into that, but I really want to talk uh, some jets and flying stuff. Yeah. You clearly do well in pilot training because you get an eagle, which I would imagine, based on everything we've talked about, that was your first choice. How stoked were you to get the eagle? Dude, this is, I think this is a wild story, and this just goes to a life lesson of, you know, things happen at the time they're supposed to happen, with, you know, how they're supposed to happen. Um, so I go to pilot training, uh, went to Shepard, and then did pretty well in the pilot training program comes down to like our assignment, you know, preferences, like, Hey, put down whatever jets you want to put down. You know, it was, it was a weird time at Shepard history because Shepard is generally speaking, like you go to Shepard, you're going to fly some kind of jet. Yep. I went to Shepard as a casual lieutenant. I was there for like eight, eight months. And, um, the first drop was Eagles, Vipers, a 10s. Everybody's like high fives. It's like just a scene straight up top gun. Everybody's like super like rejoicing on the beach, yeah. you know, it's great. Um, and then after those first two drops, then it was like five predators, five like NSA, so the non-specified aircraft or uh, special warfare uh, yep. communities, and we're like, dude, the like the world is burning, the sky is falling. What is happening right now? Um, so my class, we got out of the active duty people, we had I think three fighters out of I think twelve active duty guys in my flight, um, and I go to put my list down, like what I want to fly, and. I put one through, because it had the bombers and heavies on stuff as well. I put one through 26 F-15C. And I just repeated it 26 times. And I was like, yeah, I don't really, like, I either get an eagle or what, I'll fly whatever you want me to fly. But, like, that's, I don't really care at that point. Um, there's no plan B. There's no plan B. Uh, which is kind of funny. That's how, that was, like, kind of my academy experience. So I, I applied to the academy. And after setting foot there and, like, seeing it, I was like, yeah, there's no plan B. It's super poor planning on my behalf, but I, there's no plan B. I was like, I'm <laughs> going to the Academy. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so I put, put my you know, dream sheet in my flight commander. Um, who's awesome. Uh, Wilbur, who's just a great dude. You know, he was an eagle, uh, eagle guy. He saw my list and he just laughs. He was like, dude, I love your list, but, but you have to put something else. <laughs> besides the eagle." <laughs> and I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He, like, you have to give me something, dude. I was like, okay. So, uh, I, and if, um, you'll, you'll, you can laugh at me later, make fun of me later. That's fine. I put, uh, Eagles, A-10s, Vipers, Strike Eagles. And really, I think it's kind of a personality driven decision where, um, the A-10, like the, the Eagle obviously is like all air to air, really good at air to air. And obviously the Raptor to go for that, in that role. Um, and to me, I just like the idea of like, do I just want to do one thing really, really well? And the A-10 in my mind was the equivalent on the air to ground world. So I was like, yep, Seamall's first, A-10 second, Viper's third, and then Strike Eagle's fourth, and then whatever else after that. Um, and a funny story from pilot training, actually. I was I was probably like a week or so before I um, 
was putting out dream sheet in and I was flying with a, a T38 IP who's a CMOL guy and we're flying along. I did, you know, I did pretty well up to that point in time pilot training and every little deviation. I mean, we're like plus or minus like a couple knots, a couple degrees off heading. Dude, he's just like, you're off heading. Check your airspeed. And we're talking like a couple knots. Right. Right. And I'm like, after 45 minutes to an hour of that, I'm just like super demoralized. Cause I'm like, that's it. I'm going to go fly some, some airplane. That I don't want to fly. Right. Um, right. And uh, in the debrief, he's like, Hey man, how'd the flight go today? And I was like, well, obviously I could have done a lot of things better. You know, you're, you're probably a lot of, you know, IP injects and, uh, but I'll work on it, you know, and in the future, he was like, did you, you know, did you have fun in this flight? And I was like, well, to be honest, not really. It was, you know, kind of a stressful flight, you know? And, um, he was like, well, now you know what it feels like to fly in a two seat fighter. And I was like, dude, genius. Lesson learned. So, Coffee shot. Uh, <laughs> I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm going to fly CLC jets. For, you know, like, so that was, a, that was a pretty funny moment in pilot training for sure. <laughs> uh, but going back to, you know, the life lesson that we're talking about. So yeah. I put that dream sheet in, and whatever it was, four to six weeks later, um, we get our drop night. And I actually dropped A-10s. So I was super mm-hmm. stoked I got an A-10, but I was bummed that I got I didn't get an Eagle. And there were no Eagles in the class. So we had a uh, an A-10, a Viper, and a Strike Eagle. Those are the three fighters we had, uh, for active duty at least. And so my cool, my buddy uh, Beans uh, was uh, reserved to going to A-10s. And we we're like looking at places in Tucson. We're like, this is going to be sweet. And then four months later, um, I was working in some, you know, like an office working like awards and decks uh, for the OG staff. And the, uh, the Lieutenant Colonel who runs assignments walks up to me and um, he's like, hey, you wanted Eagles, right? And I was like, yes, sir. He's like, oh, okay, cool. And he was a CMOL guy. He didn't say anything else. Splitter Kelly. Didn't say anything else. I'm like. Thanks. Just you know, <laughs> just, uh, just to rub it in one last <laughs> Yeah, just, just turn the knife, please. Um, and uh, so, dude, like next day on my birthday, he walks up to me and gives me a birthday card. And I'm like a second lieutenant. I just had a pilot training. I'm like, dude, like, why is this lieutenant colonel giving me a birthday card? This is, this is weird. weird. This is real weird. Super weird. Uh, Sitting on the couch. And I open it up and it had... Dude, it, yeah, I was like in my in the office. Uh, I opened it up and it had an eagle driver patch in there, and I was like, "This is a really messed up joke, dude." Like, <laughs> I really want to fly eagles. <laughs> really want to fly eagles. And um, so he's like, "Congrats, dude! You got your eagle." And I was like, "What?" So there were two guys who wanted eagles. Myself and my buddy Felon, who's flying F thirty fives now uh, okay. down at Eglin, and we had, we'd gone through two classes apart. Um, and then t- we, we wanted Eagles and we got both got A-10s. And there were two guys in the class that was getting ready to graduate that both wanted A-10s, but I got Eagles. And somehow through like whatever, you know, lining up of the stars occurred, uh, they swapped our assignments. So then Phil and I went to fly Eagles uh, with yeah. Klamath. Uh, they went to Kadena together. So I've known him for a long time. Uh, great, great guy. And um, it's just, you know, it's one of those things where hey, I, you know, had I gone to fly Vipers or Strike Eagles, yeah. uh, then I would never flown an Eagle, and then I would never flown the Raptor, potentially. Uh, never done a Raptor demo. So, you know, I'm just a firm believer. Sometimes it takes patience, and, and a lot of times, you know, people like you and I, are, we're not patient people, generally speaking. Yeah. So um, that was one of those life lessons for me that was like, man, all things in due time. When it's meant to be, it'll enter your life or leave your life. And, um, and a lot of times we don't know what that next next step's going to be. But when I look at that series of events, I'm like, dude, had I not got an A-10, had I not had four-month waiting period to go to IFF and the A-10B course, I would never stop assignments, never gone to fly the Eagle in Kadena, fly, Eagle, or fly Raptors in Alaska, fly Raptor demo. You know, all those things would never have lined up the way they did. And I'm super thankful that they have. Um, obviously, at the time, I was pretty bummed, but um, especially after you like, Asked me if I wanted to fly Eagles. It's like, God, what a jerk. That's, that's it's, savage. It is yeah. true. Those Seamall guys are jerks. <laughs> yeah, man. It never, it never <laughs> stops. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a whole other conversation in itself. What what class did you graduate with? Uh, 1004 at Pilot Training. Okay. So, it were, I mean, roughly uh, about a year apart or so, because I can kind of think of the yeah. same. I was, well, not as a dramatic and as exciting of a story. You know, I, w- I wanted to go fly E10s. I wasn't good enough to. <laughs> 
to go fly A-10s out of pilot training. But in our drop, we had – we were the first heavy drop to happen at Columbus. So about, okay. I don't know, three, three or four nights before – not maybe, maybe about a week before assignment night, commander came in, and it was literally a choice, a piece of paper with 69 options, not even joking, of all the tankers, all the heavies, every base, guard reserve. He's like, I don't know what it's going to be. Just felt like your top 30 choices, and, like, we'll figure this out. And so, Just so demoralizing, that out and, dude. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was crushing, right? And we kind of, like, maybe about nine months ahead of – Ahead of that, they had started sending some guys to UAVs, but the the heavy drop, like that kind of, that definitely changed the calculus because you're like, all right, they've already been doing UAVs. And then on top of that, we're going to get heavies. And obviously the way he was telling us, it wasn't, you know, building a lot of confidence that this was going to end really exciting for us. Because yeah. in that we had, we, we had a, a Raptor, one of those like go to the Raptor or go to IFF, compete for the Raptor. That turned into a Viper. Uh, a buff, a C21, two FAPES, and an E8. So it was not a, like a great, uh, great deal. But out of that, because in yeah. pilot training, my flight commander was a Viper dude, great dude. But then we had several guest help guys who were Viper backgrounds. And I was like, man, is this what the Viper community is? Like, I don't want to be anywhere around these guys. Come find out there's a reason why those guys were there. But uh, it turned out when I did the FAPE and then I deployed, then I was surrounded by guys who were either doing MC 12s from the Viper or like the McIntyre guys were deployed same time. So it was like, okay, this is, this was the exposure that I needed to this community and okay. what it is like, I want to go fly the Viper. Right. So it took me a lot longer to get to that point, but um, yeah, you just never know. And I think you do like you land in the right spot, you grow where you're planted, you put forth yep. you know, your best foot every single day. And if it's supposed to work out, it'll work out. You're on the path you're supposed to be on, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, a lot of times it's hard to, hard to reconcile at the time. Cause you're like, yeah, do you have worked so hard just to get to here? Yeah. Just, what's going on? I want that crystal um, ball. I know. Right. That'd be sweet. Um, but uh, yeah, man, it's, it, it, it's amazing how like the stories are similar in the sense that it just took us a little bit of time and deviations left or right of course to, to find our path, you know? Yeah, I get it. And um, yeah, that's, no, it's been, I think we're both, both very fortunate to have, uh, have gotten to, to do what we're doing. Yeah. Talk to me about Eagle assignment. What it's like just only using chalk to write your briefing boards <laughs> and debrief. Uh, again, I mean, I've talked about it. If those that have listened to the podcast, like the most painful debrief I've ever been a part of was a weapon school Eagle TI debrief. And, uh, oh, that's, that, that's, that's like, good stuff, dude. I was like, can I jab a pen in my eye and then just end it now? But yeah, talk to me, um, you know, obviously you go through Klamath Falls, so we can talk a little bit about that, but talk to me about the, the Eagle, the mission set, what it was like in the squadron and kind of the tempo of life in your Eagle days. Yeah, I, I really uh, enjoy the Eagle. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people are like, B course is stressful. I had a great time. Like it was, that was where I, wanted to be from the time I was a very young kid. So I was like, this is the best thing ever. I'm getting paid to go fly Eagle jets in Klamath, which is beautiful. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a guard base. You have like most of the instructors there have two, 3000 hours in the Eagle and you're learning so much from them. It's, it's amazing. I remember um, my high aspect three ride at the B course, you know, it was, sun was going down. Um, and I was flying with Psycho Miller, who at the time was the uh, wing commander, and he was the highest type eagle guy, uh, still flying eagles in the Air Force. And I was probably the most inexperienced eagle, like, yeah. wannabe in the world. And um, sun's going down. We get stacked in a tree. And I'm looking over him across the circle. And burns are lit. We're, like, 70 degrees as high, just hanging on the blades. And, you know, this, like I said, just the, the sunset, the eagle, like, the burner cans – knowing that that's the most experienced you'll do in the world right now. I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. It's like, there's nothing better than this. It's awesome. Um, so I really enjoyed my, uh, my time at, uh, the B course. Uh, I got some, I got some heckling, uh, from them. So I, I love baseball and I actually, uh, coached an eight to 10 year old baseball team while I was a B courser. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I'd, like, I'd show up in like cleats and socks, and, you know, go back to the squad or whatever. And they're like, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm coaching a little league baseball team, dude. And uh, they're like, should you be studying right now? I was like, yeah, I probably should be. This is awesome, though. Probably should. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But, uh, so it was it was great. And then um, 
Actually, you know, I was hoping to go to, to Lake and Heath out of Eagles, and I kind of planned on that because they, they told us, hey, you're going to have two assignments. Um, so Bender in the Florida International Guard was my class. Felon was my class, and then uh, then me. And Bender was International Guard, and then Felon and I uh, were the active duty guys. And they were like, one to Lake and Heath, one to Kadena. I had lived in Spain before, and I was like, oh, I really enjoyed Spain. Uh, I like Europe, so I want to go back to Europe. And like, yep, yeah, that should, that should work out. And Felon wanted to go to Kadena, so we're like, cool, this will, this will work out great. And then uh, when our actual assignments came through, we were both going to Kadena. I was like a little bummed. And man, it turned out to be like the, one of the best blessings. Um, Kadena, in terms of the flying, was incredible. Uh, in terms of the the EO community at that time, so I got to Kadena in like 2011, uh, and then I left in 2014. <laughs> And the Eagle community was drawing down a bunch at the time, you know. So I, th- I think we benefited in some ways where they're like, all the people that weren't tactically proficient or not bros are like, hey, you're going to go somewhere right. else. And, and, to, and to all those people that if that happened to you and you're a great person, sorry, I don't mean that personally. So <laughs> generally, generally speaking, I'm... like, generally speaking, they're like, hey, we're going to send this person. I, I mean, I met, I met some great people. I got Tammy 21, you know, like that. Right. Where it's just like really, some... really crappy time for great dudes. Um but at the time, the EO community was able to kind of like consolidate the, you know, the talent and the, and the, the bench was pretty deep. Um, and the, the leaders, the squadron commanders, the DOs, uh, I could do at the time were awesome. Weapons officers were great. Um, and I learned a ton. My, my only goal that first assignment was really to like learn as much as I possibly could about the Eagle and be as good as I could, you know, uh, tactically. Obviously, lots of fun party times you have as your first assignment as a fighter dude for sure. Uh, but for me, the focus really was getting good at flying the jet um, because I knew that the next time it wasn't guaranteed. And um, I wanted to keep doing this. You know, I was fortunate that for my entire active duty career, I just flew jets uh, back to back to back to back, which was sweet. Uh, but it took a lot of work. You know, it doesn't just doesn't happen overnight for sure. Um, and we traveled a ton. And that's actually, you know, traveling there was um, – out of Kadena was one of the things that led me to the Raptor. Um, obviously the Raptor at the time was like amazing airplane. You know, it was going back to your story about pilot training. It was every three classes we get one Raptor and that was where you okay. go compete for it. And I just, you know, it wasn't my class, which was, which was fine. Um, and while we were there, um, all my Raptor buddies can, can Chuck Spears later, but I was, I absolutely hated the Raptor community at the time um, because they came out to Kadena. They were, you know, from they were all based in Langley. They'd come out to Kadena uh, to do their TSP. So like they're like, you're deploying to a place where I already live right. and we already have an air base and we already fly jets, you know, and they're getting paid like ridiculous per diem and living, you know, yes. staying at the Hilton downtown and, and the seawall. And we're like, what in the world is going on? Like, what are you guys doing here? You know? Um, and then to cap it off, we went to Alaska uh, to sit alert because at the, at the time, the Raptors uh, couldn't do the alert mission based off, you know, concerns about the auction system, which obviously through time we realized like, you know, what the issues was and, um, and everything is good to go. But, you know, so here we are taking Eagle jets from Japan to Alaska to a Raptor base where they already live and fly to sit alert for them. And we're getting paid like three fifty a day yeah. and saying the stay at base lodging. And I was like, screw those dudes, man. Like, whatever. We're up here sitting alert doing your mission, getting paid three fifty a day. Uh, but, you know, I fell in love with Alaska. I was there for about four months total. I fell in love with Alaska. It's just the most spectacular place ever. If you like outdoor stuff, it's amazing. Uh, I was getting my ID card one day, and, like, the, the person uh, at the MPF – was from Jersey. Her husband's from New Jersey. They're like, we hate, we hate Alaska. We, you know, like, what do you guys like to do? They're like, we like shopping. I'm like, okay, well, Alaska's probably not for you. Is that um, spot? Not your spot. But if you like hiking, hunting, camping, fishing, flying, like all those things, Alaska is just remarkable. And it, it like never stops. You know, you go to, you go to the Tetons, you go to the Rockies, you go to the Sierras and there's a chain of mountains, right? And you're like, oh, that's epic. And they're incredible. But Alaska just keeps on going for like hundreds of miles. And you're like, dude, this is, unreal, you know, and getting to fly around there for four and a half years was uh, an absolute blessing. So my time as an Eagle dude sitting alert there really was like, I want to go to Alaska. And that was my first choice. Uh, leaving Kadena was do Raptors in Alaska and it worked out. Uh, I want to talk about alert in Alaska. Cause I do have questions about that, but I think it's to your yeah. point too. my Uber driver beginning this month up in Anchorage from Somalia, right? Wow. Loves Alaska. Like talk That's about awesome. like polar, 
polar opposites of places. Um, yeah. And like someone who's like embracing, because if like guys have flown who who live up there, you if when it's nice out, right? It's awesome to be outdoors and doing stuff. But you also have to have your winter sports stuff you do. Otherwise, you'll be miserable. Uh, oh to yeah, get out people there and do stuff. Yeah, There's I mean, when you're, when you're talking six hours daylight in the you know six yeah. to four hours, depending on you know how far north you go, but uh, in some places it's very even less than that. But if you don't do winter sports, then um, then you're in your inside. Yeah, it's miserable, you know, but I, uh, at the time there were a bunch of a crew of guys that all had, uh, snowmobiles. So, or snow machines for anybody from Alaska listening right now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so crew of guys had snow machines and I was like, that rips, like there's so much fun. And I grew up yeah. riding jet skis and I was like, Oh, this, this looks pretty cool. I'm going to try this. And then I loved it like a thousand times more than riding jet skis. Cause you can like go up and down, you can jump off stuff is sweet. Um, so having a crew of guys to do that stuff with and be able to get outside in the winter time was really, really important. And uh, whether it's skiing, cross country skiing, ice fishing, whatever you do, like, you know, just get outside and do stuff and enjoy Alaska because it's just this untamed place in my mind still where, um, you know, like you're not the apex predator. Yeah. Human beings walk around and like you will get rolled up by a moose and people worry about bears. I'm like, I, I'd worry more about moose if I were you because the moose will trample you and that sounds and they're they're not scared. Bears will generally speaking like run away unless it's like a sow protecting her cub. But moose don't scare they don't get really scared. They're just like whatever. I'm gonna they're run you down. They're huge, man. The uh we had a guy jump seating up with us who uh is considering moving up there and the guy I was following lived from there and he was like, Hey, what vehicle are you gonna get? He's like, I'd say I would recommend getting a four wheel drive truck. But this guy was looking at like a four wheel drive Subaru or something. He goes, yeah, okay. Like that'll probably get you around. He goes, something that you might not consider is there are people who are in wheelchairs in Alaska because they hit a moose. Right. And he's like, you hit that thing and it's coming through. I'm like, yeah, you know, people have died. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, It's it's a big animal. So dude, yeah, (laughs) Yeah, definitely. We just sold it on that. You'll die if you hit a moose or a moose <laughs> will attack you. It's great. Um, alert. So I hear, hey, I hear Alaska yeah. Airlines offering reduced fares right now. Yeah, that's right. You can get great window seats. Great There's uh, <laughs> windows for Steph. Um, yeah. <laughs> follows along Instagram. That's yeah. sit by a window go. seat. There you go. That's, that's what, yeah, that's wild. Um, talk, <laughs> talk about how lucky that kid was to not be sitting. I mean, just period. Like what a blessing. The fact that yeah. no one was sitting in that seat when that uh, window ripped out. But, yeah, I mean, you're zipping so. across the globe doing, you know, 500 miles an hour at, yeah. you know, 30,000 feet above Mount Everest. It's a miracle. These, and it's amazing. These things fly, right? So a lot of yeah. smart people, but stuff happens. That's why I was um, laughing. I got a commercial airliners and people are like upset their Wi-Fi doesn't work. I'm like, you're, you're flying in a magic chair at like almost the speed of sound, you know, yeah. whatever, for, you know, 35, 40,000 feet up. Like it's going to be fine. Right. You're Read a book. You're Read a book. Read a book. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Uh, Blitz here, who's my uh, one of my last squadron commanders, had him on the podcast. Weapon school instructor, phenomenal dude. He was flying for Delta for a little bit, and he was telling me a story of like coming into Atlanta, summertime thunderstorms. They're just getting rocked, right? They're doing everything they can just to land the plane safely. And he's like, it's a rough last thirty minutes, whatever it is, lands. Hey, it's great. But then standing there at the exit and like, there's people who make snide comments about, Oh, that was pretty rough. Huh? Like, well, you know, were you in the Navy? He goes, what I want to say is you're welcome. You're welcome yeah. that we're alive because we yeah. just, you're, you know, hurled through the air. Yeah. Like your Wi-Fi. I'm sorry. Your Wi-Fi was out. I'm sorry. I was a little bumpy <laughs> and you didn't get your coffee. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're welcome. I want to talk about alert. Uh, I imagine you've set quite a bit of alert, both in the Raptor and the Eagle. Did you ever do any intercepts, any scrambles, or just anything in general? I'm I'm, I'm curious. I've never. Yeah, done no, it, so. they, no. It's I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's just one of the missions up there, and and it was something that everybody does, you know. So when I was there with the Eagle, it was kind of a dedicated detachment that was there doing that mission. So we did a lot of alert, and we typically flew a decent amount because you know we in a normal squadron, you rotating those jets out between the combat squadrons and the alert, you know, alert detachment. Uh, but the Eagles we had there were just up there for alert. So we flew a, a good amount of CT, not much CT you can do uh, with airplanes that have live missiles, uh, but you have lots of gas and Alaska's epic. So you go rip around and provide, you know, trading aid to, to whoever's out there. Uh, but yeah, I did, I did do a couple, um, a couple of like alert 
scrambles and, um, and intercepts. And the first one I did was probably the funniest one. Um, it was like two o'clock in the morning and two o'clock in the morning is roughly when the bars get out, of, you know, closed down and people start leaving. So I'm sitting alert <laughs> and we get a phone call at two o'clock in the morning. It wasn't one of those like, like, you know, you hear the clacks and go off and like everybody's running right. and putting their G-suit on. Like I might, my, one of my only like hopes as a pilot was like to be able to scramble in my flip flops and board shorts. And I was like, this would be sick, but I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, so we get a phone call at two o'clock in the morning and I was the wingman at the time. Uh, the guy who was the, uh, the flight lead picks up the phone and thought it was the bros prank calling us. Cause they would call and like just middle of the night, like scramble, 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 you know, and you're like, dude, I'm trying to sleep. So he <laughs> thinks it's a joke and hangs up the phone on the alert facility that or like the alert command that's calling us. And then the phone rings again. And he's like, hello. Like, uh, I think we were disconnected. You know, like, <laughs> it's like, Oh man. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a real one. So we uh, get our stuff on. Uh, it was very early January. Uh, so very little daylight in Alaska, hop in the Eagles and uh, get going. And thankfully, you know, one of the, or some of the, the words of wisdom I was passed from the, uh, the older guy was make sure like your jet has everything you need to be in there for a long time. Because if you get a call in the middle of the night and you have to run to your jet, uh, you're not going to have time to think about water and stacks and whatever else and piddle packs and all those, all those fun things. Yeah. So I was like, great. So I like, and the Eagle cockpits is massive. Like that, even if you love the Viper more than Eagle, at least you can admit the fact that the yeah. Eagle cockpit is luxurious. Yeah, um, nothing but room, activities, all sorts of stuff in there. So, yeah. so good. Um, so I put all that stuff in there. We, uh, you know, get our annex booster suits on, get our, our gear on, run down there, take off. Uh, they were like plowing the taxiways in the runway because there's snow on it and uh, it's still like actively snowing. Uh, we were blasting off in the middle of the night. Um, and we were airborne for. That was my longest Eagle flight. It was a little over 12 hours. Um, and that was a long night. I came back, like had the five o'clock shadow, looked like a shell yeah. of a human being. Yeah. We, you know, we tanked. I think we ended up tanking like six times at night. Um, and for, for those people that, you know, because I, I get the question, you probably get it as well. Like, oh, how many times do you have to refuel on the way to, you know, Asia or Europe or whatever? And it's like, well, we need to refuel these amount of times, but we refuel, you know, probably twice that many times because we want to make sure we have as much gas on the airplane as possible. Um, so kind of the same thing. I think we were fueled six times a night and, uh, this is actually, uh, there's a funny story of this too. Uh, so we're on the tanker getting, getting gas and like on our fourth one, it's still pitch black. We went super far North, like over the North coast of Alaska. Um, this is going for like a Russian bear or something. Yeah. There was, you know, there was some activity that they were like basically moving us as chess pieces just to kind of like, uh, there was never like anything close on that one. Um, yeah. but they were kind of just moving us back and forth. And, um, so like the fourth time at night tanking and, um, the boom operator at this point in time is like giving us like positive reinforcement. She's like, you guys are doing great. We're like, Oh, I know we're doing terribly now. And you're telling me we're doing great. Like <laughs> we're, we're clearly <laughs> struggling, dude. Um, but this, it's like the, the best part of this whole pity. story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I know I'm a terrible pilot. Okay. I'm sorry. Got it. Um, it's a really nice but, way to put it. Yeah. Uh, it was very kind of her. That's great. Yeah. That's um, so this is like one of the, this is the funniest part of this whole story though, is that I'm on the wing of the tanker at night and my flight lead is getting gas. I had like maybe 30 minutes prior, um, taking go pills and we have the, you know, the anti exposure of the poopy suits on. So they have this like rubber seal around your neck. Uh, it's not very comfortable. Mm. And I take the go pills I start getting like the, the face tingles and face itches, you know, and I'm looking, I'm, we're westbound. I'm on the south side of the formation looking north. And then I start seeing this like green glow in the distance. And I'm like, dude, I am tripping on these <laughs> right now. I was like, what is happening? Like I'm looking at this case one three five Eagle. And then like this green haze and glow behind his airplane. I'm like, like, bro, this is not good. Like, this is not good. This is wrong Somebody call for help. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, like, pulling at the, the rubber seal. I'm, like, Dude, get this thing <laughs> off me. And, uh, and then I realized, you know, like, 15 minutes later, I was, like, you're an idiot, dude. This is the door to the lights. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So it was pretty pretty funny uh, 
pretty funny story. And then like, so we came back and, um, that's like 12 and a half hours dehydrated and delirious. You're like, Dude. then you know, we, we swapped out. So they, they kept the airborne caps at night or that day. So we came back and it was finally like daybreak. Um, and we like high five two Eagles that pass us and they're going to go replace us, um, on, on station because after like 12 hours, they're like, all right, you guys probably need a little break. Dude, I can't, you know, Alaska's probably a little bit different than down in the Southern States or, you know, the, the, the 48, right. Sitting alert. Cause most of those intercepts, it's an airliner that's not talking or a citation. And I mean, I guess, you know, it could be a couple hours, but to like launch, even if you're going to, you know, to go intercept a Russian bear, right? Like you're probably driving quite a while to do it, but to launch and then to an unknown 12 hour sortie would, that just sounds absolutely terrible to me. Like you got to stack yeah, a lot not, of pedal packs, be ready. Yeah. It was not a lot of fun. Um, we try to keep it fun on the radio, you know, try to keep it lively, yeah. but, uh, yeah. stay alive. I think the most, the most efficient story, other story I did was like, it was like three hours. It was the best thing ever. We literally like scramble, take off, intercept two bears, uh, wave hello, say, Hey, like, Great to see you guys. Uh, have yeah. safe travels back to Russia. You know, and they they leave and then we fly back to uh, Anchorage. Dude, the story was like a three hour story. It was great. That was the most efficient alert story in the world. It was super, super awesome. Super gentlemanly. So, yeah, it was just... like, yeah. It was, I don't even think it was. A, I don't even. Remember, it probably wasn't even a. No, yeah, it was like it was like late morning. It's like oh, this is really kind. Of. Thank you guys for yeah. planning your planning your you know your your bear flights around our uh, sleep patterns. I appreciate that. <laughs> Everyone just wants to fly during the daytime and just yeah. keep it generally. I wonder where th- those guys, that's, that's going to be a long flight for them, but it happens fairly frequently. Yeah. I don't know. You know, sometimes it gets covered yeah, in the news. Ebbs and flows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this was a uh, speaking of alert though. Um, probably the most hilarious intercept I've ever done was not sitting alert, not in Alaska. It was actually in Virginia. I was doing a practice demo and we had the, uh, noted bear space for the airbag practice area up to 15,000 feet. Some dude in the 172 just flying along, flies right over Langley, uh, not talking to anybody. And uh, I was like in the middle of routine. So they, you know, towers like, hey, there's strange traffic, you know, 10 miles away or whatever. So I see him on the displays. I'm like, all right, I'll keep track of him, keep doing the demo. And then he's like six miles away. I'm like, all right, well, now we'll set, we'll set a, you know, uh, a ceiling. And the guy keeps just trucking straight for Langley, like right over the field. And I told the guys, like, hey, guys, uh, you know, we knock off the demo practice. So the guys, I'm going to go, I'm going to go check this guy out, get some tail numbers, because he's not talking to anybody. He's not talking to the tower or anybody. So I roll up next to the 7172 in a Raptor. Obviously, he's doing this, and I'm, like, super AOA'd oh, up, you know. Yeah. And uh, But I'm, I'm, like, lightweight, so it's just, it's hanging just fine. You know, I'm, I'm probably, I don't know, whatever, 100 knots, somewhere around there. And I just parked the Raptor next to him over Langley. There's some guy that got, like, a telephoto lens, got some great pictures of it. Um, so I read the tail numbers off to the tower controller. And then obviously this guy realizes like, you like, you done messed Oops. up a eh, Iran. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he calls the tower, uh, but I already given the tail numbers on stuff. And then uh, they, I, I don't know what they sorted out. Um, but uh, yeah, that was probably one of the funniest ones. Cause this guy, he was probably not expecting to have a Raptor just roll up on his left wing. Completely clueless. I imagine a lot of those guys who get intercepted busting a TFR. I mean, it's, it can't be a good feeling. Just like, Oh no, you know, see some yeah. jet roll up. And then, not good. Um, I was thinking I had again nothing nothing to compare, but I was it's actually a regular sort of like rolling off the perch. So at Shaw, there's Sumter uh, County Municipal Airport that's they carve out a chunk of the Class C, and it says in all the charts right like you know don't enter Class C without permission, and then you're supposed to take off. They go eastbound. This dude took off went westbound. But by the time, like, everyone realizes it's happening, like, there's not much time. And so yeah. I was, uh, you know, in a four ship rolling off the perch, and I passed this guy by, like, 100 feet. And, you know, and it turns out it was some, you know, grandfather with his kids in the pl- – his grandkids in the plane. Um, it would not have been – you know, my gear's down. Like, I would have survived via a rocket motor and a parachute, you know, but like not, uh, not where we want to be. So pay attention to where the airspace is. You think in Virginia too, like dude, if you're flying around in a Cessna, yeah. Virginia, Maryland area, you are very keen on, on airspace. You go South quick. Yeah. You know, and <clears throat> you think so, but uh, it happens. And yeah. I remember in Alaska, you know, we did, uh, we actually did um, 
presidential support for uh, President Obama. He rolled through Anchorage, and I actually I was actually flying over overhead in Seward, Alaska, when he was filming like the Bear Girls episode, and they're on uh, the glacier down there. Uh, which is kind of pretty cool. We're like, oh, I'm just hanging out in Seward. President Obama and Bear Girls are down there, just you know, fishing for some salmon. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. But um, yeah, in Alaska, it was a, it was an issue because you know. Uh, people would go out to the backcountry hunting and they'd be gone for a week or two weeks or whatever. And no one gets published. TFR gets published and they're yeah. like no cell comms, no service, nothing. So they're like, I just finished two week epic hunting trip. Um, and I'm just flying back home in my super cub or whatever. And, uh, then they like bust a TFR cause they have no idea TFR is even there. Um, so that was, you know, that's just tough cause you're like, man, I feel bad for these guys cause they're, they just have no clue. They have no means to even get the information. Yeah. I wouldn't even th- yeah, think about that. Cause you know, again, too, like Alaska, you're up, up in the middle of nowhere and just going to be flying, you know, flying your bush plane VFR yeah. the last thing. I wonder if like an ASAP report, if that like gets them out of trouble, you know, if someone like busted a TFR under those circumstances, I'd be curious if. I think you know. the fizz, the fizz up there in Anchorage is pretty good. I mean, uh, the, the folks I worked with were pretty awesome and all of them are also like pilots and hunters and fishermen. So, yeah, you know, they were pretty cool because Alaska is just a really unique place. Um, you know, the, the approach corridor, um, to Merrill field and like Ted Stevens international is like right next to Elmendorf air force base. Um, yeah, so you have a 300 foot clearance on finals. You're on ILS final in your Raptor and there's like a super cub that's like passing right underneath you or above yeah. you, you know, by 300 feet. It's pretty, pretty wild. The first time you see it. Yeah. We do a, a steeper climb out, <laughs> um, I probably think all all airliners do. I would imagine out of Ted's. You're on the triple, right? Yeah. So he's trying to show off. Yeah, no big deal. That thing's all. It's all just all 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 thrust, you know. And you go blasting out, you know, or some float planes. You just got to avoid them, though. That's like it's taking off. Get a steep climb out, you know. A lot of planes flying around there. It would be awesome to go fly around in floats up there. I think do the backcountry flying. It's. it's, uh, I love flying uh, fast things and all those, you know, all stuff. Yeah, dude. Doing 80 miles an hour over the treetops with windows down and landing on like a flying. battle bar is like the most fun flying you can ever do. Yeah. It's incredible. That's yeah. I think that, that's pure flying. That's why I'm excited to screech his new plane when he gets that, when that's finally built, man, that's like, that's it is a think. sweet looking airplane. Yeah. Um, that was, I, get, I got my, uh, my tail dragger, um, licensed to get bush course up in Alaska when I was there. And, um, yes. one of my flights, this, you know, the instructor was, he's maybe like 21 years old and he's like, rolling hand rolled cigarettes. So I'm like, dude, this is going to, this is going to be wild. You know, <laughs> this is going to be wild. Uh, <clears throat> so we take off a Talkeetan, Alaska and the Tokusitna river is just the, the West of it. So we take off and then jump over the line of trees, get over the river. And we're still low level, you know, down the river, like 10, 15 feet off the water, having a great time and have our Bose headsets on. And he's like, Hey man, you might have to play some music. And I'm like, sure. So he like puts on some, like some awesome bluegrass music. And I'm like, this could not be better right now. I'm literally flying, you know, a backcountry airplane down the river, listening to bluegrass. The sun's coming up. Alaska is like, there's still like snow out there. I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever, man. It's awesome. Dude. That's yeah. That's some pure flying. That's doing it right. Yeah. Um, good. well, dude, let's, let's talk about the transition to the, to the Raptor. When, how, when did you find out? Did you want to go do it? Yeah. It was, uh, so, looking at the, the future of the eel community in terms of they were drawing down and we had no idea what was going to happen. Um, and then also just my love for wanting to go back to Alaska and living in Alaska. I was like, Oh, I'm just going to put down Raptors to Alaska. You know, that's my first choice and, um, did, did well enough. My first time that I was able to get that choice, which is awesome. Um, went to Florida, did the TX, which is like 11 flights. Uh, it was pretty short, which is, which honestly really? was not bad. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the mission sets between the Eagle and the Raptor are so similar. Obviously, the way you yep. employ the airplanes and the capabilities are very different, but the mission sets are the same. So we're speaking the same language, just learning a new airplane. Okay. Um, and did that. And then from there, went to Alaska, got to Alaska on December 16th of um, 2014. Um, and I was there for like four and a half years and uh, just had had an awesome time um, flying Raptors there. I think there were some, there were some elements of, transition to a, a new airplane that I think probably every single person that transitions to a new airplane uh, goes through, you know, there were some things that in the EO community were like, Oh yeah, we're doing this, uh, you know, and 
in some cases, we're like training against, you know, based on proximity to in Asia to, to China. So we're training to some things that were like higher level than, uh, than at, at the time in, in the Raptor community. Um, so I'm like, why are we, you know, like, I've been flying, flying jets now for about four years. Um, like, this doesn't make sense to me. So please explain to me, you know, why, why are we doing this? Um, and it was kind of like the pushback, like, oh, stupid eagle dude, like, you know, she got a bad attitude, doesn't want to learn, or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm like trying to use my brain here to like have yeah. a you know intelligent conversation on tactics and what we're doing so we can remain lethal and survivable. Like that's what I'm asking the question. I'm not asking to be a jerk, you know. And um, so they're like, I think every every pilot that goes to new jets um, goes to those growing pains. I was going through at the time with an Australian exchange pilot uh, who you know was a, a Australian F-18 weapons officer, FCI, uh, super knowledgeable. I'm like, dude, am I? taking crazy pills right now and he's like no like i this is i, I feel the same way this is silly um so but we went through that time together and, and he's a absolute amazing human his family's great um and then after that initial like adjustment period uh i really you know learned to love the raptor and um it's just a it's a great airplane it does everything you want to do or want it to do yeah when you're talking about some of those differences or in that i guess that your question because i know what you're, what you're saying uh but i'm curious specifically about like the eagle versus the raptor and you got fourth gen fifth gen the threats and the things that the raptor can do vices like the vice the f-15 were you you know the threats and the scenarios you're training to in the eagle uh, were, you, were you so like ingrained or thinking that's the way that's the way it, it is or that's what the threat's going to be versus what the raptor community was looking at was the, i assume the raptor community was looking at you know, fifth gen type threats and like the next threats of a near peer adversary or at, at, the, at the time we were not at the, to, at the time we were, oh, like we were, okay. Yeah. We we're actually training against uh, more advanced threats in the Eagle at the time compared yeah, to okay, the I missed community. A, okay. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's why I was like, what are, what are we doing here? Huh. You know, this seems kind of silly. And you know, obviously the, the long range uh, stuff is, is completely different, you know, and I was just learning yep. new stuff and that was, that was great. This is more, mostly like within visual range stuff in terms of like within visual range maneuvering, how we're going to employ the airplane. Um, there were some assumptions that were being made at the time that I, I just didn't think were, were valid. And, um, and I was not alone. Like this is not me like being some super smart yeah. person. Like this is a common across multiple people and it's, it has shifted now, which I think is a good thing. Um, but uh, yeah, there's differences in terms of like how we're employing and what we're trying to, et cetera. But you know, like everything, it, it ebbs and flows. It'll go in cycles. You know, when I first started flying Eagle, uh, the clam maneuver was like the hotness. And I was like, Oh, you, you know, and you're like, and then it went out of, out of vogue, you know, I was like out of favor for a while. Then it came back and was like, have you heard of this new thing? I'm like the thing from three years ago. Yeah, I have heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> so with everything, it's always yeah. like a, the good, the good idea fairy re- returns with, um, I guess the loss yeah. in history that, uh, it's interesting. I think people have said, that you know you got about six weeks in an organization where you as a new person have like a viable outside perspective but it's a balance yeah um and a little bit different i think flying jets but where you're you can't be like well we used to do it this way in my previous you know for sure yeah like you got to balance that but then too it's like once you trip that six week point or whatever it might be, now you're part of the problem, right? Like you're indoctrinating, you're ingrained. And so finding that balance of where you can have that input. Um, yeah. Maybe it takes a little bit longer to simmer when you're talking about complex tactics and, and jets and things like that. Yeah. And you know, I, I definitely I couldn't, couldn't agree more in terms of that. And it's definitely a fine balance, right? We have our 30, 60, 90 rule in the fighter community <laughs> and that serves us very well. And uh, I got to a point where I was like, I just want to ask a question because this is not, this is not sitting well with me and it like, you know, but at the same at the time, I realized like I was, I was obviously a lot, <laughs> excuse me, a lot younger, probably way less mature, uh, way less tactical. And uh, <laughs> my delivery, delivery probably wasn't great. So, uh, you know, uh, those are all things that I, that I have worked out over time. And, um, uh, you know, like how, how do you learn lessons? You have to go through tough times to, to learn lessons, you know, and, um, yeah, so it's just, you know, it's a balance of like knowing when to speak up or not speak up and how to deliver the message. Um, and, and the thing is every, every person is different. You know, we like to think that the fighter community is very like just, uh, focused type a and like no feelings and whatever else. And, 
Uh, I think you and I both have probably had to fill out her feelings, of course, field before, you know, and it's like, hundred percent. Really good. Come on. Um, it's actually, yeah, there's, it's, it's a wide range of people and personalities yeah. and backgrounds that land inside of a squadron from the pilots to the, you know, support staff that that's in there. So yeah. You, yeah. Wide, wide range. Yeah. You know, gotta be careful. The, can you compare the Raptor and the Eagle? Like, Go into the Raptor. Did your essay and the tools at your fingertips just rapidly expand, or was it just a different problem set and still learning it? But again, I quit. I think like Nokia phone versus the iPhone. Is that a fair like analogy? Yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of equate them to cars. So I look at the Eagle as like a 1970s Dodge Charger or Challenger. We have a manual gearbox, and like if you want to smoke the RPMs and blow the motor, like it'll let you do it. You know, and the Eagle yeah, is the same way, it. where it's like, hey, you want to put the jet out of control, like. Good luck, man. I hope that works out for you. You know, you get these you get these like <laughs> departure control tones that are like progressive beeps in, in you know in um, in their frequency. And uh, at the time, it was like three beeps max. Max. If you get like more than three beeps out of control tones, like you have to go talk to the boss, you know, kind of thing. But if you were three beeps, you're max performing. So everybody's like trying to like, <laughs> trying to get to it. You know? uh, there's the line. Yeah. There's the line. Find, um, find the line. Yeah. So you know, but if you want to do those things, it would let you do it, you know, and the Raptor, um, there are, you know, physically more things that limit you in terms of flying the airplane. Right. But even with those, like even that governing on the airplane, the performance is still way better. So you're like, okay, I, I know like in my brain, I know the computer is limiting me here, but even with it limiting me, I'm still doing way more than I was doing the Eagle. You know, so I look at the Eagles like 1970s, you know, model charger challenger. And I look at the, the Raptor is like a brand new sports car that's got the you know flappy pedal gear boxes and like can go zero to zero to a bazillion in like under two seconds kind of thing. Um, yeah. th- that's kind of how I equate the two. But yeah, the Nokia and the, the cell phone or like the old Ericsson or maybe the I don't know maybe the maybe the Razor is too new. Who knows? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. That's, that's too much, too too advanced, too advanced. Um, yeah, man, the Raptor is just a, like it's an impressive jet to one like watch fly. Seeing the demo is amazing. Like I think that's by far just like, like this thing is just not making sense. But yeah. doing large force exercises with Raptors, um, seeing the the tapes afterwards and like what the Raptor sees versus what I was seeing, uh, just like it's phenomenal. And even just like I mean, again, the performance wise, like I remember, like Raptors want to take off first, right? They don't want to be slowed down <laughs> by someone going three fifty on departure. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it, don't be inconvenience. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be held down, and I don't want to be slowed down <laughs> by being behind you guys. So we're just going to take yeah. off first. Uh, like I'd like to just go to sixty thousand feet, please. Can I do that? Yeah. Thank you. you know, I'd like to go. I'd like to go to Mars. You know, uh, but uh, yeah, and I think you know having the having the eagle background, I thought was really beneficial. Uh, and the reason I say that is because you know, in the eagle or in a viper or in a hornet or whatever you know, fortunate platform you're flying. You have your radar display, you have your defensive displays, you have your heads up display, you have your Jehemex, you have all these things, but they're multiple inputs of data to you, right? And like your brain is fusing that picture together. And you also have calm, which is like blasting in your ear and people are stepping on each other and whatever. Yep. Um, so you have to be able to fuse that picture in your brain in an eagle or a viper or a hornet. Um, and the rapture, a lot of that done is stuff, stuff that's done behind the scenes. It's all back end stuff that's basically displayed to you in one like beautiful color coded, you know, picture. It's not the B scope that I grew up with. Um, but what I think that did was having the presence of mind to listen to calm, process it, correlate stuff and make sure the picture that I'm seeing makes sense. I thought was really beneficial. And all my buddies who are Raptor babies. Um, and for those who are not in the federal world, calling somebody a Raptor baby is not derogatory, which means they grew up in the Raptor community. I've had yep. people, uh, we got, there's, there's somebody that got, uh, pretty upset that, uh, we called them Raptor babies. We're like, it's not derogatory. It's like, I'm an Eagle baby. You're a Viper baby. Like, it's just, yeah. it is what it is. Um, but you know, they, they show up and they, <laughs> they get this like wealth of information at their fingertips. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times like, you know, there's a critical call that's made, uh, or there's some piece of information on the display that's there and present. They just don't process it because they're overwhelmed by the information. And I think having that background, at least, was helpful to me. Uh, not saying that, you know, something that starts off in the Raptor community can't process at all. I think it just takes a little bit of time because it's, it's a lot of information, just like the F-35. I mean, the F-35 sensors are phenomenal. Um, so when you get into one of those airplanes, it's just a lot of stuff being presented to you. And it's, I think what makes you really good at flying either one of those airplanes is knowing what information is important at what time and how to use it. Uh, and that takes a lot of experience, I think. 
Yeah, I've never flown a Raptor nor a F-35, but I've said the Viper is an easy plane to fly. Processing all the sensors and putting the right sensors in the right place, capturing that data, processing that data, employing the jet, the formation, running the tactics, that's where the challenge comes from. And then you mentioned B-scope. So for like those that don't realize it's not the... Um, that's a you know mechanical scanned radar going back and forth plus or minus x number of degrees and then it's displayed and then at least in the viper you know that that plus or minus 60 degree cone coming out it's in like widened on the mfd so you have to interpolate the movement of the aircraft because while it might look like it's coming straight down the screen or doing a j hook moving uh away then you have to process where that jet enemy jet is going how they're going how you're going to intercept them but then just correlating, like you said, the radio calls, because you're out there and you have your sort to shoot. Maybe you're not picking up the contact that you're supposed to sort, so you don't see the whole radar picture. And like, at least for me, that's where all the penguins were falling off the iceberg as the iceberg was melting underneath me, uh, trying to figure it out. So I guess it's just different problem sets, but the technology makes uh, solves a lot of problems and then creates new problems too. You know? Yep, for sure. The uh, I imagine the Raptor demo when that came about. That was something you're probably pretty excited about to apply for. Is that a true statement? It is. Um, you know, I, I didn't even consider it when I started flying jets because the Eagle demo obviously was phased out. Um, and I was, like, well, I was, you know, and, and it wasn't even like I, my path. The one I go down was uh, was to weapon school, and it's you know I obviously didn't uh, didn't work out for for whatever reasons. And um, and thankfully because of that, like the Raptor demo thing opened up and. Um, I was speaking with my DO or my, um, he's not a DO at the time. He became a DO. Then my, uh, then a squadron commander. Then he was a, actually the OG at, um, at Kadena for a while. Uh, he was a Raptor demo pilot as well. Um, and we were like playing golf in Hawaii. It was my first TUI on the Raptor, uh, real tough hardship tour, you know? Thank you uh, for your service. Ra- Raptor, Raptor you. standard, Raptor <laughs> no, standard. <laughs> collecting full per diem, have your own rental car. Yeah, no. Yeah. That's not the $3 life. and 50 cents. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Move, Thank you for moving you up. Like, moving up like a Jefferson's man. This is great. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so we're talking. He's like, oh yeah, I was a Raptor demo pilot, you know, and we started talking about that. He was uh, a Wings of Blue guy at the Academy. And I was like, oh, that sounds super cool, you know, and I never really thought about it. And by the time I was in the Eagle, I was like, I really went to weapon school. And then I started really thinking about the Raptor uh, demo thing. And I actually applied in uh, 2018. I didn't get selected that first time I applied. Um, so that's when Loco got hired. So actually, if uh, that worked out. You and I would have probably flown together yeah, a bunch. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, it didn't work out that time, which is totally cool. And once again, things happen for a reason. So I was in Alaska for four and a half years and uh, that was awesome. And then I also, uh, when I did demo, um, blessing and a curse, COVID was the first year. So I got a third year uh, doing demo and yeah. that was pretty epic. Um, and I wouldn't have had a third year had I not, you know, um, been, you know, passed over for that, for that job in 2018. And, um, and I just met like amazing, like the maintainers on the team, like the relationships you, you make and the friendships you meet or friendships you, you, uh, you have from that. It's just amazing. So I, I'm thankful I went through the time I went through and, and how everything kind of shook out, you know? It's funny. Yeah, all these like parallels that kind of just hearing, like I never thought about doing demo and then Shaw had a show, an air show and, uh, our Viper Viper demo had started back like the year prior a year and a half prior right and i saw like rocket ripping around i was like oh that's kind of cool right but yeah. i didn't think anything of it until the air show and then some of my buddies who were thunderbirds at the time you know i was talking to them like if they like the air show world and things like that and then lo and behold like two weeks later they put a call out for the new viper demo pilot to apply so um right place right time sometimes it can be wrong place wrong time and then you know you're on the bad deal train but you know every yeah. now and then it, it it works out so I think, you know, um, the demo thing is my, probably the same perspective you have. It's just like, unfortunately, I think that uh, a lot of the, the calf squadrons probably like poo-poo on demo because they're like, oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, they're just having a great time. And like, they have no idea how much how much work it is, you know? And then you realize like <clears throat> putting this whole circus together is a lot of work and a lot of time. And you really yeah. don't have any days off. You're pretty much just gone all the time. Um, <clears throat> and you're doing a lot of like, you're doing a lot of practical flying stuff, Like you're always going to new places. You're always having to operate new environments um, and being, you know, having that adaptability and having a small team maintainers, you know, solve these problems um, is, is a, its own like challenge, but also a huge reward. And turns out most airport spaces don't work on Saturday and Sunday. 
So <clears throat> when the jets break, nobody's at work. And you're like, well, how do we solve this problem? You know, and you have uh, your team, and that's pretty much what you have. So you build a huge trust and relationship with the maintainers, um, <clears throat> and um, that that relationship was um, definitely one of the best parts about being on the demo team and, and having that family of just kind of people you travel around. I just joke and tell people like we're just traveling band of gypsies, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> our, car- our caravan is a little more expensive than the most, but uh, <laughs> right. nonetheless, we're still a caravan of gypsies, you know? That's what, I mean, to me, like having the, the maintainers in the team was definitely the best part of it. It obviously is fun to go out there and rip around the jet. Like you alluded to at the beginning, like you should be getting arrested when you land for ripping around downtown Miami uh, doing 600 bills. Dude. But the maintainers, so man, they like, they, yeah, they, they made it happen. Like that was a blast. Don't get me wrong. That was pretty awesome. But, um, the maintenance team, cause I, my big frustration on the demo aspect, which, uh, we, we fought and I think it's, uh, hopefully it's, it was, it was improving as we're going. And then, uh, yeah, the issue I saw was like the, the maintenance guys, right. In the eyes of the maintenance world, often, um, I mean, demo is a, it's a resource drag, like it's a resource drag on the wing. Like you're breaking jets, you're taking jets, you're taking people, you're taking parts. Like it is a resource drag, but you're out there doing, I think something good for the air force, for the nation, for the DOD, trying to spread the good word, right. Inspire the next generation. But nonetheless, when the jet breaks, like that's going to require a lot of effort on a lot of people and take away time from their primary job back home, yada, yada, yada. So it was fighting for the maintainers to get the recognition I thought they deserve. Cause you got like a master sergeant who's running the team. He's doing all the travel coordination. He's doing, you know, he's making sure the jets are in the right, um, you know, maintenance phase cycle, everything, all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed. Um, but he's only really getting like for the Viper, right? you like, there are three jets chopped to us. He's only managing three jets, big picture, you know, his counterparts managing like 24 jets down in the squadron. Right. But he's speaking in front of millions of people and, yeah, it's just like this balance of trying to like prove the worth. That's why the nice thing about the Viper, this is the only reason ever to have a two seat fighter would be to put someone in the back seat during the demo and try to rip their face off and expose them to him. So I tried to really get as many bosses as I could in the back seat because I think that was important to like a little bit of appreciation for what demo was, seeing the guys, just how they all work, all the work they had to put into it each and every day to make it happen. So. Dude, yeah, I, yeah very, I agree with you. That was a <clears throat> that was a uh, that was a battle we faced as well for my three years, and um, some leadership gets it, some leadership doesn't get it. And yeah. <clears throat> I look at it in the sense of uh, yes, you know, maintenance as we know is very numbers driven, um, as opposed to the upside of things. Uh, we obviously care about numbers too, just a very different way. And um, I'm like, okay, well, show me another mass sergeant on this air force base that is solely responsible for $300 million in assets works them on the road does not have all these back shops and all these like 300, 400 yeah. people to work on the problem. Like he doesn't have that as, as disposal, you know, he has him and the team maintainers that are there on the trip to sort this problem out, you know? So in terms of like critical thinking, problem solving, all these things that you want a senior NCO to have like those skill sets, like he's doing every single weekend, like every single weekend. And, and he's also talking to millions of people and he's the face of the air force, you know, um, for rapid demo and maintainers and all this, all this stuff. So it's like, when you think about large scale responsibility, uh, I think that is a higher responsibility job, um, 100%. you know, than, than some of the other jobs that, you know, maybe other mass sergeants are doing on base, but you know, on their, on their sheets, like, Oh, we, we maintain X amount of airplanes. I'm like, okay. With, all the resources, all the contract support you could ever imagine, you know, pulling for you Monday through Friday, you know, um, obviously working the main, main guys work on the weekend sometimes as well. Depending on the health is health of fleets. So I'm not, I'm not saying they only work on Friday, but my point is like you have infinitely more resources, uh, and manpower than the, the demo teams do on the road. And they could be across the country trying to solve a problem, you know, and don't have that. So to me, that, that speaks volumes about the character and the, the abilities of the demo team superintendents, regardless of whatever MDS they're on. Um, <clears throat> and I think that is a huge thing of like, uh, that was a huge focus point for me, at least to bring it up to the bosses when, when we had those discussions, because I'm like, got it on your, on your sheet of paper, your Excel document here. I, I understand what you're saying, but that doesn't convey the whole picture. And like I said, some were, 
some were understanding and some were not. Um, but yeah. I, can't, I can't change their opinion, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I, I was fortunate. I guess I had some good bosses that did that. Um, found out like maintenance, a lot of like their, you know, co-peers or the, you know, the, the seniors and the chiefs that you kind of battle back and forth. But I think moral of the story is maintenance makes the world go round. I'm grateful yep. for all the maintainers out there because, I mean, they're putting in the work to make it happen. So we can go out there and, and break the jet. But that is not a thankless job because I, I mean, I hope they know they're appreciated. But man, they're putting in long hours to make it happen. It's impressive to see. That's yeah, two, like, the greatest air force in the world. Yeah. And I, like two, two thoughts on that. Like uh, if, if you're listening to this podcast and you're an aspiring fighter pilot, whatever you do, be kind to your maintainers. 100%. Uh, I mean, I've seen people be complete clowns and jerks to maintainers. Uh, I mean, my grandfather was a mechanic for 50 years. You know, I turned wrenches on cars with him when I was growing up. So like to me, like the maintenance world and the community, uh, I mean, I love, working on the airplanes and planes of fame as well. You know, I, I love that element. And it's like, these people are out there, um, sometimes 12 hours a day, it could be 140 on the ramp, or it could be like right. minus 20 on the ramp. And they're yep. still out there turning wrenches, getting the airplane ready. Um, so be kind to them. Don't be a jerk. Um, <clears throat> I, I think generally speaking, you know, I have, I haven't met any fighter pilots that I thought were really, really good fighter pilots that were like complete jerks. Most of them are, are quietly confident what they do. They are absolute killers in the airplane and they're, they're nice to other people, you know? Um, be a good human. Yeah. Be a good human. So um, that's, that's one thought for any future aspiring fighter pilots uh, out there. But um, <clears throat> the second thing too, I think is equally important. And this is a, when we talk about culture and morale in the air force and the military uh, as a whole, we see that, you know, recruiting numbers keep going down uh, <clears throat> morale. I feel like, you know, you, let's look at any meme page on Instagram or whatever. Social media. <laughs> like you'll be, you'll be inundated with stuff. That's like 90% true. We're not even using 10% rule here. Where it's like 90% right. true. And you're like, like brother, uh. this is not good. Um, <clears throat> but for the, uh, for the maintenance perspective, you know, I think one of the most important things you can do uh, as either a pilot or if you're in leadership uh, is explain the why to people, you know, Simon Sinek obviously wrote an entire book about explaining why and why it's important. Um, if an 18, 19 year old airman joins the military and is out there at 140 degrees on the ramp, turning wrenches and their hands are getting burned, they're getting cuts all over the place. They're like, you know, like bruise something, what, whatever it was, you know, because they're, they're working on these airplanes and they don't have any direct connection to why their job is important. Then they're not going to have any morale. They're not going to feel like this job is rewarding or satis you know, provides them satisfaction. And that is such a huge thing that I think leadership has to do. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of times I've seen, and you've probably seen the same thing where we get so focused on like, what is, what are we doing today? Okay. Now we're done with today. What are we doing tomorrow? Okay. Now we're done tomorrow. What's, what's the next day? You know, and like we're so focused on these little things that in my opinion are in the grand scheme of things, not relevant and or important uh, on the holistic picture. It's like you have 200 plus maintainers in a squadron, like getting their buy-in to understand why their job is important. Yeah. In the example of the Raptor, like, dude, you're out here turning wrenches on this airplane because we only built a very small number of these airplanes. Oh, by the way, there's no other airplane that can do what this airplane can do. And we absolutely need it. Like if we ever were to go to a near peer threat or a peer threat, like we need this airplane. And obviously you can expand upon that. I'm just kind of hitting right. the wave tops on that, but it's like that conversation is so important. Um, and if we did more of that, I think it'd be a much, much better place in terms of morale and overall cohesiveness. Uh, Kadena was a great example of that. I mean, in the 44th, the ops and maintenance, we got along really well. I mean, I, I remember walking to the upper fighter ramp from the 44th and I couldn't walk more than like, I don't know, 15 steps from the jet back to the squadron without a maintenance bread van pulling up and like take me back in the, into the uh, building. You know, it was just one of those things where like, Hey, if I see you out there and you need help, I'll help you. Like you're trying to push your box and you're also trying to do this. Like I'll push it for you. Like I'll carry whatever you need, you know? And just that, back and forth, um, being a good human and go back to that point, um, pays dividends, you know, and we get so wrapped up in our worlds that unfortunately we don't do that nearly enough. Yeah. Take the time. I think, you know, I thought demo when I did it, I'm not like every, I mean, every demo team's I think successful, but it was easier uh, to get buy-in for the long days, the working extra, because at least the maintenance guys on my team, 
I think the feedback I got were like, I mean, they they took it personally, right? Like if I took off and had an airboard, if I took if I taxi out and had a taxi back in because of a maintenance issue, it was like a personal hit. But I think you can there in demo, right? It's a very easy thing to tie your effort to what the objective is to get that jet airborne fly a successful show, right? Like yep. you see it. And the exposure I had early on is in the B course. Actually, I was getting out of the jet and you know, all the, you know, I, I, he was a young airman. I don't know if he was like in, I think he was in training. Cause you know, they're training some crew chiefs as they go along and he goes, Oh, so you're done for the day. You, you heading out. And it wasn't like condescending, but he legitimately thought I walked out there Yeah. I flew and then I was getting in my car and going home. It's like, no, this is really where like now the work's getting ready to start. We're going to go in, spend 30, 45 minutes watching our tapes. We're going to write down a bunch of data. Then we're going to get together. We're going to spend another 45 minutes or so, 30, 45 minutes recreating everything and like figuring out what really happened. And then we're going to go really start debriefing and that could take hours to dissect. So we learn and go and go do it the next day better than we did it today. And, and um, if you're in the so, C-model, you can leave the next morning. You can just debrief. Right, right. yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, it was an 18-hour debrief. Like, okay, again, um, you're really selling me on this. Uh, you get chalk and you get 18-hour debrief. So I did uh, sit through a four-ship TI uh, debrief and left and went to Popeye's Chicken for breakfast on my home after the debrief. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, brutal. Yeah, the chalk debriefs. Like, I remember chalking launch and leave TI. Like it's just it's like, uh, it's just painful. Yeah. I was impressed with the, like the eight, you know, the eight pack of chalk of each different color. You know, I'm like, well, who even makes this? Like, where do you get this chalk? Like it just, and then again, for those who are listening, not aware, like everyone else in the entire world has embraced the whiteboard since, you know, it was invented like in 1985, <laughs> except the Eagle community that still uses chalk. I wonder if they still, I mean, I'm sure they still use chalk. I think the, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of going towards the way of the whiteboard from what I gather. But, you know, it depends on the mission set. So in BFM, I think people still chalk it. Uh, I think the lines yeah. just look better because especially I mean, after you're like, <laughs> <clears throat> after you're, this is my opinion, obviously, I'm skewed. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think the, the, the lines Do look tell. better because after Do your 10th, yeah, well, after your 10th cup of coffee, like you're. You know, uh, yeah. some people's second can of whatever nicotine product yeah. you choose, like your yeah. hands start doing this a little bit, and then you like see the board, and you're like, "Ah, oh, I, I didn't do those successive ninety degree check turns in my break turn." <laughs> you know, like, like just draw the line with chalk, dude. Looks better. Uh, oh, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's one of those. It's one of those things. You know, it's funny. Simple joys. All right, Cabo, uh, we're gonna wrap up here. I got a, I, I got three questions. What I'm gonna hit you with? First one, I'm gonna let you think about it, which is. You know, if you found 15 or 16 year old walking down the street, but then the next two questions I'd like you to ask for our answer first, before we roll into there I was would be, these are simple. I think softball ones, the best part of being the Raptor demo pilot and the worst part of Raptor being the Raptor demo pilot experience, et cetera. So those two first, and then we'll talk about reflect on life lessons and what you tell young you. Okay, um, I'm going to respond with Adam Sandler. One question, two parts. I'm just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so uh, best part of the rapid demo, uh, two parts, sincerely. Uh, the first part is the team. Um, just having that family of, yeah. of team you travel with. You know, you become really, really close to them, um, have lasting friendships. Um, I mean, my my first uh, demo superintendent in 2020 um, – he just had a beautiful baby boy and asked me to be the godfather for his son. Like you just like that level of connection, like that family. Right. And that's, yeah, it's that's huge. amazing. You know, I um, come from a pretty big family. So having that kind of environment is normal and something that I really enjoy. And I really found that in demo and loved it, you know? Uh, and then the second best thing uh, is really just being able to go talk to kids and, and knowing that I was them, you know, when I was 11 and, and younger, and how that can shape somebody's life in a really positive way. Um, so that, those are kind of two things, like an internal to the team, like an external to the team kind of benefits to be on a rapid demo. Um, the worst part of being on a rapid demo, um, that's why I told you bragging earlier when you said your uh, demo maintainers had six or three jets. The uh, worst part of a rapid demo is that we, we borrow jets every weekend. So we don't have, we don't have enough Raptors um, to just give the demo team you know, airplanes. So we get new jets every weekend and new jets, new problems. Um, 
And, um, you know, our maintenance guys, like I said, I just credit them with the world because they, they understand the impact of what we're doing and they will bend over backwards to make sure that jet is good to go. And, you know, unless the jet was like really bad off and we were like, you know, I, I came, there, there may have been like one or two times we got home late from a show, um, because they were just working really hard to get the jets back to, uh, where they were. And oftentimes they're turning them better than they found them, you know, cause we wanted to build those relationships and make sure yeah. they were good. Um, but not having your own airplanes was uh, very challenging in a lot of ways because you could have, I mean, silly stuff that makes no sense to you and I. Hey, I've got two shows back to back weekends in California. Okay, cool. You're going to come back to Langley between the shows? Well, like I, like I leave on Monday, then I have to come back to the same place. You know, like, no, no, you're going to come back to Langley. Like, okay. Well, it could be, a little, you know, it could be this a little more efficiently. But um, so there were some things like that that were kind of annoying and just the logistical aspects of, not owning your own airplanes, but having a flying mission, uh, I think was, yeah. was probably the worst part, um, of demo. And then going back to your first question kind of ties into one of you know, the second part two of my number two question response, uh, part one, part two, yeah. a part two, <laughs> uh, a, sub, a two point. sub, oh, sub yeah. paragraph. Yeah. Subsection. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's us code. Yeah. Something, something. There's some numbers. Yeah. Squiggle, squiggle lines. Well, right. Hey, I have probably could write tax law now at this point. Yeah. Um, the, you know, if I were to meet a 15 or 16 year old kid that wanted to fly jets, uh, or was your question to fly jets or just meet them in general? No, I think if you, if you walk back, if he ran into you 15, 16 year old Cabo walking down the street, is there any advice you would give him? Is there something you tell him to do differently? Um, yeah. Like looking back on things, what would you, what would you say if he ran into you? Um, I, generally speaking, I would say, one, if you want to fly airplanes, that's your goal in life. Go to the academy, fly airplanes, or ROTC, whatever whatever path you want to do. Like the number one thing you have to do is do well in school. Um, so you have to have your grades. That is the easiest um, discriminator for the application admissions committee is to say, hey, we're not even looking at this person's application because their grades aren't good enough. So that's an easy kill. Like just spend time on school um, and make sure that your grades are, are good. The second thing I would say is to find like two to three things you really enjoy doing. And, you know, I, I don't really care what they happen to be. They could be flying, they could be sports, they could be music, they could be art, they could be whatever, but find something you enjoy doing and go crush it. You know, there's there, I've talked to students that have had this like mis, misperception of, of how the admissions process works or misconception of how it works. And they think they have to do like all the things under the sun. They're like, I did this, 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 and like I did 10 different things. Right. Uh, but they didn't really excel at any of them. They just kind of did 10 things. Um, and I, I tell them, you know, like when you leave the academy, yes, I get you want to fly jets. I want to fly jets too. Uh, and that's, I went to school there because I want to fly jets. But when you leave, you're also an air force officer and you're going to be in charge of people. And depending on the job you do. And like, if you're on a, a crewed aircraft, um, you're a potentially aircraft commander. You're responsible for the, the load masters and the, everybody on the airplane. Um, so you have to have some you know level of leadership, right? And you, and that you want, or the academies want to see that you have that, internal desire to lead and, and succeed in a group. So pick two or three things. If you're playing soccer or playing baseball, like be the team captain. If you're in music, be the drum major. If you're in, you know, national honor society, be the president or be one of the, you know, one of the people that, you know, vice president, you know, whatever it happens to be, but pick two or three things you really enjoy doing and, and dive into those. Um, take leadership roles, take the chances to learn. Um, and then the third thing, so academics, two or three things you really enjoy doing. And then the third thing I would recommend doing as well is that um, we, we all find ourselves like doing this all day. Um, <laughs> so turns out people don't and um, not picking on you. So get your feelings for people that are younger than 20 or 15, 16 years old. Um, yeah. But you know, a lot of times like the social skills, like you and I have this conversation right now uh, is challenging for people. You know, like some people who just cannot yeah. carry on a conversation um, so I would say if you're one of those people that just does not interact with people and talk very often, I would highly encourage you to go get like, you know, uh, speech lessons or interview prep or any of those things, right? Because you want to be able to take an idea, formulate it in a well thought out manner and then convey it to whoever the panel is, right? Cause you're applying to the Academy, but you're also applying, um, to get a congressional nomination that can be for your, you know, Congress, uh, man or woman or your Senator, but you're going to go and sit for a panel and they're going to ask you questions and you're going to tell them about yourself and you want to be able to convey that in a really articulate manner. They're like, Oh, this person's not a complete idiot. Great. Um, 
<laughs> you know, so those are kind of my three pieces of advice. Uh, so school, pick a couple of activities you really enjoy doing, crush them. And then thirdly, um, you know, work on your ability to interview, respond, be articulate, be thoughtful with your responses, um, because that will make you stand out in your interviews uh, when you apply to you know, apply to the academy. Here's a funny aspect. I had not thought of that last that last piece, right? But everyone's like glued to their phones, sitting down. So my social experiment that I do now, one, I have always had like an aversion to eating by myself. Like mm -hmm. if I'm going to go, it's like come from the squadron, right? You're going to go to a lunch push, like go around and, hey, who wants to go to lunch? And if no one want to go to lunch, I'm like, well, I guess I'll just starve today. Like I don't <laughs> need to go to lunch like that, right? I'm not going to go sit in a restaurant by myself. That has since changed, right? Now that I'm flying around the world, sometimes you end up on weird schedules. You're like, dude, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten like 20 hours. Other guys sleeping or whatever it is, like, all right, I'm going to go eat. So then I'll find myself eating in a restaurant, you know, get some cultural experiences, but I'll like observe and like look, you know, what's going on around. But it's all too funny to see like a table full of like young people who are just like glued to their phones, not having a conversation, which is like my, the whole reason why I want to go do a meal in the first place. Like I always see nutrition and then like have a conversation with someone yeah. and not look like a, like a social outcast that I don't have any friends. That was my, my big deal. But I talked, I told it to my brother way back when he's like, dude, I eat lunch by myself all day long, like all the time. I'm like, eh, well, I can't do it. I'm just, I, I need the social aspect. So. I think, I think it's just one of those things that's like lacking, you know, I think it's, if you want to set yourself yeah. apart, I think it's really important. Yeah, it's good stuff. Cabo, man. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. It was great chatting and catching up. I know we're going to do a bro chat. I know you said you'd be willing to hang around for there. I was so the more Cabo coming your way, everyone. But uh, thanks again for taking the time today and just to share a little bit of your story, man. Thanks, bro. I appreciate it. Whatever.